Hi, welcome to room nine, our region's largest classroom. I'm Mrs. Williams. I teach first grade in the Windsor C1 School District. That's in Imperial, Missouri. This is Mrs. Forth. Hi, everybody. I'm from the Rockwood School District. I'm excited to be here with you today as we learn a little bit about reading and math. So before we start, we really want to know, where are you? Are you near the airport? Top Golf? Are you out at Six Flags? That's where I live. Yay! Are you near the Magic House? Closer to the zoo? Maybe you are close to the St. Louis Arch or the Mississippi River. Where I'm at, I'm a little bit south of St. Louis in Herculaneum near the Mississippi River. It looks like we have friends from all over St. Louis joining us today. Thanks for joining us, guys. Very exciting. Okay, let's go ahead and start with our welcome poem. I'm going to point to the words. Feel free to join along with me as I say I'm ready. Welcome, welcome, everyone. How are you today? We are so glad to be with you learning math and reading too. And speaking of how are you today, we need to do a zone check because before we get ready to learn each day, we check in on our body and brain. Really smart scientists that study brains know that happy, calm brains do the best learning. If you are in the green zone, that means that you are calm, you are happy, and you are ready to complete your work, help others, and reach your daily goals. And this is the hand signal. So if you are in green zone, show me you're green and good to go. If you are in the blue zone, you might be feeling a little slow and low today. You might need to draw a picture get a hug, or think some happy thoughts to be ready to learn. Your hand signal will look like this. If you are in the yellow zone, you're maybe a little frustrated, anxious, or maybe just really excited in a good way, but not ready to learn yet. So you need to take some deep breaths, get a hug, or talk to an adult that can help you be ready. If you are in the red zone, you have flipped your lid, your hand signal looks like this, and you're probably not learning with this right now, you're very angry or upset about something. You need to stop, get help from an adult, take some deep breaths, and check the size of your problem. So show me your hand signal. Are you green zone and good to go? I hope you are. If you are blue, yellow, or red, choose one of our strategies to help you get ready to learn. Are you guys ready to get started today? All right, before we start, let's do our room nine chant. Can you read this along with us? Okay. I am smart. smart. I am kind, I am brave, I am me. Hi friends, welcome back. Are you ready to stretch your brains with reading? Do you remember what we did yesterday if you were with me? Yeah, we started to explore nonfiction books. Let's review really quickly before we jump into this book some of the things that we talked about. So the first thing that we did is we really asked ourselves, well, what is nonfiction? Nonfiction is, yeah, it's a type of book or text where you learn more about people, animals, places, and things. It gives us information, it tells some facts, and explanations. It explains more about something. Newspapers are nonfiction, magazines can be nonfiction, and books can be nonfiction too. You can even write nonfiction. We also talked a little bit about some of the parts of a nonfiction book. Nonfiction books look a lot different than the fiction stories that we read. You'll see a table of contents in a lot of nonfiction books. The table, table of contents tells us all about the parts that are inside the book. You'll also sometimes see glossaries or indexes. The index can tell us what pages to find, certain words, and the glossary can help us better understand some words. There's a lot of tricky words in nonfiction, a lot of vocabulary, so we read it in a certain way. You'll also see extra text features. You might see captions and photographs. You might see bold words and headings. And we're gonna talk more about that over the next couple of weeks so we can understand why does the author put these text features there and what do we do with them? We also talked about how you read nonfiction. You can read nonfiction in parts. 
you don't have to read the book from the front cover to the back cover. In fiction, story storybooks, you have to read it from the beginning to the end to understand the story because stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But in nonfiction, you can read just in parts like we did yesterday. You also want to spend more time reading the part and stopping and thinking, what did I learn in that part? Can I say that part in my own words? And you want to really notice the text features. Authors put the text features there for a reason. So we want to make sure that we're reading all the parts on the page, looking closely at the photographs, looking at the captions and reading them carefully because we can learn even more information from those text features. So we're gonna use all those things as we read a little bit more from this book, Places in My Community by Bobby Kalman. And remember, Crabtree Publishing is allowing us to read this book. So let's thank the publishing company and the author right now for getting this book into our hands. Thank you! Yeah, I hope they heard it all the way from wherever you are. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into the book, Places in My Community. So just like yesterday, I'm going to spend a little time looking at the table of contents so we can decide what part do we want to read. Yeah, I see some of you remember some of the extra parts that are in here. What is a community, places to live, places to work, places to learn, places to buy food, places to shop, community safety, places to get well, long ago, fun places outdoors, and then words to know on our index was in the very back, right? Okay, what are you thinking? Give me some ideas of what parts you wanna to read today. Oh, where we can buy food and shop, oh, I like that. Community safety, that's important. Okay, well, let's start with places to buy food, and we'll just keep reading parts as long as we have time for them. Deal? Okay. All right, so places to buy food. That's right, page 12. So I'm going to turn to page 12 to get to that part. Before I read that part, let's take a look at these pages. What are you noticing on these pages? Yeah, it kind of does look like there's a title at the top. Yeah, that's called a heading. Can you say heading? Headings are text features. The headings are there to give us a clue of what we're going to be reading about on that page. Sometimes it exactly matches what's in the table of contents. So this heading, Places to Buy Food, lets us know before we start reading that we're going to learn all about where you can buy food in your community. What else are you noticing on these pages? There are real pictures. I'm glad you said real pictures. These are photographs. In nonfiction texts, a lot of times you will find real photographs because they're talking about real things, real people, real places. So this is a photograph you could see. Oh, maybe that's a mother and her daughter looking at apples. This reminds me of the, yes, it reminds me of the grocery store too, yeah. Here's a photograph of a family eating dinner. What about over here? Oh, it looks like she's in a garden. Maybe she grows her own food. What do you think this is? Looks like lettuce. Yeah, lettuce or kale or some other kind of leafy green that you can make a salad from. Maybe spinach. Yeah, those are all great ideas. Is there anything else that you notice on this page? Oh, there's a word on here that is darker. Yeah, we call this a bold word, a bold word. That's another type of text feature. Authors use bold words to show us, hey, this word is important, or hey, this is a new word. So a lot of times new vocabulary or some of those tricky words that we see in our nonfiction books are actually bolded for us. It's a way for our brains to notice them. They must be important, huh? Are you ready to read these pages? Okay, let's start with the heading. Places to buy food. People need food to stay alive. 
most people buy food at a supermarket. Supermarket. Have you heard of a supermarket before? Yeah, I call it the grocery store. What do you call it? By the name? Yeah, maybe Schnooks or Deerbergs. <laughs> Aldi, yeah, that's a fun place. Trader Joe's. We have lots of different types of supermarkets around here in St. Louis, don't we? You can buy any kind of food there. You can also buy food in restaurants. That's where they are. Now that I'm looking closely at that photograph, I noticed, look, there's somebody back here in the background. At first, I was just like, oh, this is a family eating. But I think now they're not eating at their house. They're at a restaurant. They went and ordered food at a restaurant. Many people grow vegetable gardens. There she is. Do you have a vegetable garden? I do. Yeah. Actually, right outside my window, there's tomatoes growing and kale and banana peppers. You have a garden too? Oh, you planted a garden, but nothing grew. That happens to me sometimes too. Okay, so remember we talked about how it's important to read and think. What did we learn on this page? Yeah, there's a lot of ways that people in a community can get food. They might go to a supermarket or a grocery store. They might go to a restaurant. They might grow some food in their own garden. Great. Okay, let's flip back to our table of contents. What do you guys want to see next? Oh, I heard somebody say fire truck. Well, fire trucks. Hmm. What are they there for? Yeah, to help us, to help keep us safe. I wonder if we're going to see the fire truck in the community safety section. Do you want to read that part? Okay, what page? 16. I just love that we can skip around in nonfiction books. Oh, there's the fire truck. You guys were right. Good predictions. Okay, community safety. There's our heading. There's quite a few bold words on here. Do you see them? Can you point to some of them? Yeah, we've got police officers, police station, firefighters, fire station, sirens. Those are all pretty important words if we're talking about keeping community members safe. Let's go ahead and read. Community safety. Communities need to be Safe. Police officers help keep communities safe. Here they are. There's the photograph to match. People call the police station when they need help. Yeah, here's the police station. You noticed, yeah, they labeled this photograph. This is a label. They're saying, hey, hey readers, this is a police station. That's where the police officers work and get information on who they need to go help. That's right. Firefighters put out fires. They wait at a fire station until someone reports a fire. When they drive to the fire in fire trucks that have loud sirens. So once they hear of a fire, then they drive to, to the fire. So loud sirens let everybody else know that they're coming that's right great information that actually was not even in this book you guys are doing a good job of thinking about all the things that the author bobby Kalman included in this book so how do we keep our community safe there's police officers firefighters that can come and help you out if there's a problem great readers that's all we have time for today, but we're going to get this book out again tomorrow and read a couple more parts. And I want you to remember when you're reading nonfiction, think carefully, what am I learning? And look out for those text features, like bold words or labels like we saw in the book today. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you're going to have a great time learning new math tricks with Mrs. Williams. I can't wait to see your faces tomorrow. Off you go. 
Thanks, Mrs. Ford. Hi guys, it's time to get growing our math brains. So let's go ahead and get some counting in to warm up our brain. This time we're gonna count by 10, clapping all the way to 100. Get your clapping hands ready. Here we go. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. All right, this time we're going back. Here we go. 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, zero. Great job. Okay guys, so I'm coming to you with another strategy today for adding and subtracting to 10. So by the time we're done learning together today, you'll be able to say, I can, you say it, add and subtract within 10. And today we're gonna to be using a number line to count on and count back to solve number sentences within 10. So let's go ahead and get our number party started. I want you to try this number sentence, five plus two. Go ahead and write it on your board or your paper. So five plus two equals. Now, if we're counting on, if we're adding, combining two numbers, we need to count in the direction that the numbers get bigger because we're starting at five and counting on two more. I like to say start when I touch my beginning number because I can't start counting halves until my finger moves off that number. So ready, get your roller coaster finger ready. Up, 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 and down, start. One, two hops, five plus two more gives you seven. Nice work. All right, because we were adding, we're counting on, we hopped in the direction that the numbers got bigger. But watch out, this time we're taking away eight minus one. Go ahead and write your number sentence. Looking good. should look like that. If it doesn't, go ahead and fix it right now. That's okay. All right, this time we're taking away eight minus one or eight take away one. So we need to count in the direction that the numbers get smaller. We're gonna have less or our number will be fewer when we get finished. Now, if you like to do mental math, if you're ready to do it inside of your brain, right now you're starting at eight, you're putting eight in your brain and just counting back one. If you're not ready for that, it's okay. We're gonna start on one, and or we're gonna start on eight and hop back one. Here we go, up, 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 and start on eight, hopping back one, one. When we hopped back one from eight, what was our new number? Seven. We have eight and we take one away. We have seven left. Read our number sentence with me, eight minus one, equals seven. Good work, guys. All right, try this one, six minus two. Did you remember that we're counting back? We're taking away. I'm gonna give you a second to solve this one. Good trying. You're growing your brain. All right, did you start on six? Up, 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 up. And start, and count back two. Start, one, two. Six minus two equals four. 
If you made a mistake, it's okay, fix it right now. If you got it, good for you. Let's keep growing our brains. Let's try seven plus two. So we're starting at seven. And are we adding on or are we taking away? Yes, we're adding on. Whoops. Okay, I'm gonna give you a second to solve it. Did you start on seven and count on two more? Start, one, two. When you start on seven and go two more hops, you get nine. So read our number sentence. Seven plus two equals nine. Did you get it? No matter what, if you tried your best, I am super proud of you. I'm gonna give you the snake chair. You are super. All right, try this one. 10 minus zero. Hmm. Did you remember that this is a takeaway? So we would be hopping back but wait, how many hops are you going back? Did you say zero, none, nada? You're right. Watch what happens when we hop back zero. We're starting on 10 and it's like our finger is glued to 10. We have no hops to go back. So if we start on 10, and hop back nothing, we still have 10. Good thinking. All right, try this one. Four plus five. I'm gonna let you write your number sentence and try to solve this one on your own. How are you doing? Good start. Let's check in really quick. Does your number sentence look like this? This means that we're counting on What was the sum? What was the total of four plus five? Well, let's check. So in this number sentence, we have four and five. Now, when I count down on the number line, I like to start with the greater number because that means I have less hopping to do. But either way, you'll get the correct answer. And let me show you what I mean. Remember when we add, we can do the flip-flop. We could start on five, start one, two, three, four hops, and that gives us nine. But we can do the flip-flop, we can do it just as it's written. We could start on four and hop on five more. Start, one, two, three, four, five. It gives us the exact same number. Either way, both of those um, number sentences work. Both of those hopping strategies are just fine. I usually just like to start with the greater number because then I have fewer hops to go. All right, let's do one more. Six minus three equals. So we have six and we're taking away three. Go ahead and write it. Let me take a peek. How are you doing?
Are you hopping on or are you hopping back? Yes, we're taking away, so we're hopping back. We're going in the direction the numbers get smaller. We're starting on six. How many are we hopping back? All right, let's get our roller coaster finger ready and do this. Up, 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 and down on six. We say start. One, two, three. Six minus three equals three. Excellent work. I'm gonna give you the fireworks cheer. Here we go. Boom. I'm so proud of all of your hard work today, guys. That's about all the time we have together for now. Um, but I want you to make sure that you take your room nine rules with you. Be safe. That's our rule number one. You're gonna make your space bubble and keep your hands, your feet, and your things inside of it. That way you and everybody around you feel safe. Also, make sure you wash your hands really well. Rule number two, be responsible. If you're being responsible, you're taking care of yourself. You're doing your chores and your schoolwork without arguing. Rule number three, be respectful. Use nice words in a nice voice no matter who you're talking to and follow your adult's directions right away. Rule number four, make yourself proud. You'll know that you're proud when you have that warm, happy feeling inside when you think about the choices that you're getting ready to make or that you've made during your day. If you feel like you have to get sneaky or you wouldn't want the important people in your life to know about what you did or what you're going to do, that means you need to make a better choice. So I hope that you make fantastic choices today and I'll be seeing you again soon. Bye. Teaching in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.